His grace is sufficient for each and every one of us, no matter what we go through. You know what? We live in a world, but you got to understand, church, we're just traveling through. Amen? We're just traveling through. This is not our home. Our home awaits. Amen? And we know it's going to be grand over there. But you know what? I want to I want to take everybody at, that I know with us. You want to take your friends, Amen. your family, any, anyone, a stranger walking down the street. Hey, let's go to heaven. Just say, Lord Jesus, come in my heart. Is that he, didn't he make it that simple for us? To say, Lord, I recognize Jesus, I recognize that Amen. you are the Son of God. I repent of my sins. Come and be Lord. Of, come into my life. Save my life. Redeem me. But be Lord in my life. Amen. Amen. So we give God all the glory. If this is your first time here, we just want to welcome you. And we believe in having a good time in the Lord and, and really giving him all the glory that he deserves. Amen. And that means we could stay here for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and we still wouldn't give him all the glory he deserves, amen? Because he deserves all the glory, amen? Because he does so much stuff that we don't, we, we're not even... I passed a guy the other night, Wednesday night, or Thursday night. I was coming down 175, about 70 miles an hour, and it's raining. And this man passed me in a big old truck. And you know what? He wasn't going the right way down the freeway. He was going, <laughs> the, he was going the wrong way down 175. Oh, wow. And as he passed me, I go, whoa, wait a minute. My God, your God had his hand in protection because you know what? I might not have been paying that great of attention. I saw lights coming, but I thought he was on the other side of the freeway, Jeremy. But he came right past me. God has his hands on us when we don't even know what's going on. Amen. And we give God all the glory for all things. If you're watching today, stand up and give him glory. Give him praise. Lift your hands. Lift your voices. He is, he is the Lamb of God, and, and he is right on the right hand of the Father now. He intercedes for us, and he liveth to give intercession for us. Amen. So we give him all the glory and all the praise. Good morning. Good morning. What a great day to be alive, isn't Hallelujah. it? <laughs> it's always a great day because it's the day that the Lord has made. And guess what? Amen. We get to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So, it, in it, you know what? It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter if we're in the deepest valley or on top of the mountain. God's still the same yesterday, today, <laughs> and forevermore. So, we can always rejoice in everything that, go, that goes on in our lives. And as a church, we just rejoice with you that God is blessing you financially and keeping you. There's people that are losing their jobs, but we haven't had anybody lose a job. And, and God is just remaining faithful. You remain faithful with your tithes and offerings, and we just thank you for that. If you're new here, first-time visitors, we don't pass an offering basket. Most of the people give online. We have baskets by the doors there if, if someone wants to contribute. But we're not going to beg anybody for money because God is our source. Amen. Amen. So we just rejoice in it with you and God's faithfulness over your life in your finances and in every area of your lives. Are you ready to worship this morning? Hallelujah. Well, let's all stand. You know, the word says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So let's just take a minute and just, just in your own way, give God thanks this morning. Father, we just thank you today that you are an awesome God. We thank you that you are moving in this place. We thank you for your presence that is here today. And, Lord, we're believing for mighty things today, um, an awesome visitation of your spirit in this place. And the other part of that verse says, we enter into his courts with praise. So let's just lift a loud voice of praise this morning. Father, we just praise you today. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to share a couple of miracles I seen yesterday. It was uh, approximately probably around 4.30 in the evening. God's still in the miracle working business. Y'all believe that? Amen. I witnessed it with my own two eyes. And it's probably the greatest miracle, both of them, that i ever seen. 
there was two young men that give their life to the Lord. Amen. And the Lord reminded me, you know, we're seeking after his hand, seeking after his face, and that is very good. But he said, go ye and preach the gospel to every living creature and make disciples. So I want to encourage you, not a message of condemnation again, but I want to encourage you, preach to the people beside you. If you really love them, he said two commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you really love your neighbor, you will tell them about the good news and the gospel of Christ. Amen? Amen. And that will bring joy in the house, and you'll, see, you'll get to see the miracle firsthand. Amen? <laughs>
If you're in it with me, I'll begin. And when you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. You're the only truth, the life, the way. I'm done chasing feelings, spirit. Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead us, Lord. Oh, Spirit, lead me. So they started taking the blood enzymes. I'm not really sure. I was, I'm just repeating what I heard. Something your enzymes need to be from 0 to 11. Hers were at 7. They said, that's good. Another one. They said, it's at 8. They said, one more and you're going home. I said, praise the Lord. We've been praying. Next one, come back at 46. They said, you're staying. In fact, you're going to be admitted and driving to Tyler. It's looking worse. We started praying. I'm telling you, there's power in prayer. We started praying. They took another test. Now, this is hours and hours come back at a 15.5 they said it ain't below 11 we don't know what to do it ain't making sense it ain't textbook I said praise the Lord that's my God that's working right now amen that's my God that's working they said we're going to send her on down there to get some tests and just to be sure they released her yesterday evening blood pressure back to normal enzymes back to normal (laughs) 
She unloaded her stuff in the car before I could get it. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, God's still in the miracle working business, church. He's still in the weird miracle working business. If you ain't seeing it, it's because you ain't professing it, because you ain't preaching it. He said, you have not because you asked not. Crystal didn't know it, but when she asked me to lead this song, Spirit, lead me. I'm like, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Spirit, lead us. How many in here need something this morning from the Lord? I want you to raise your hand loud and proud. We're amongst family right here. Make your petitions known before the Lord. He said, if you'll ask the Father, this is the Father speaking, he said, if you'll ask the Father in my Son's name through the Holy Spirit and believe in your heart and not doubt, he said, I am faithful and just and I will give it to you. His promises are yes and amen. It's time, church. It's time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I didn't see everybody's hand that raised, but God did. <laughs> I'm going to encourage you right now. I want to encourage you. I just told you about three miracles that just happened this weekend. The only way to move God is through faith. If you really need something and you really want something, I want you to step away from your seat. Come to the altar, step out in the aisle, grab somebody, pray with it, with them, with everything that's within you right now. I'm going to ask you. Don't be ashamed. We're amongst family. When it's out of our control, it means He gets all the glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whenever, not if, whenever what you're praying for comes to pass, I want you to be so bold as you were so bold to step out and you're so bold to, to ask Him. But when he gives it to you, he said, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. When what you're praying for right now comes to pass, I want you to grab a mic the next time you're here, the, as soon as you can, and I want you to rejoice and give him the thanks in front of everybody because God's still in the miracle work of business. Amen.
and know that I am God. Wait upon the Lord. He hears your prayer whenever you ask. Don't question, just know. Faith of a mustard seed, just know. Those who are faithful in little will be faithful in much. Lord, we just thank you for this day. You know, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit is waiting, patience.
see, sometimes it takes time to unpack all that stuff off. As we draw so close to you, we wait, Lord, as we draw so close. Let's press in right now. As we draw so close to you, as we draw so close to you, oh, we never need to be in a hurry when it comes to the things of God, do we? We need to just let God speak, touch our hearts, minister to the needs that we have. And if we'll do that, God will always be there to answer the prayers that we have in our life. So, Father, Lord, everything that's been done during our praise and worship, Lord, we seal it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, lives are being changed. Lives are being quickened. Lord, needs are being met. And for that, we give you all the honor and all of the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray, Lord, if there are still decisions that need to be made this morning, Lord, that each one that's here will make those decisions. And Lord, they'll surrender every area of their life to you. And Lord, they'll not try to hold little secret compartments to the side. But Lord, that we'll all surrender everything to you. For then and only then do you really have complete control of our lives. Because Lord, you're, you're so precious and you're so gracious to us. You'll let us hold on to things if we want to hold on to them. And I pray your Holy Spirit will continue to convict us that we'll go like, no, I don't want it. I want to give it all to you, Lord. And that we'll indeed give it all to you. So we wait on you, Lord, and we wait on the Holy Spirit. Just, just for a moment before we move forward. If you were able to surrender some things in your life this morning, you don't have to tell me what they are. Just raise your hand and say, yes, I gave some things to the Lord today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 That's what it's all about. Just about giving things to him, letting him take control of our life. Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. What a sweet, sweet, sweet spirit.
sweet presence of God today. I know you sense it. <laughs> you can't not, not sense it. <laughs> it's just here. Amen. God is so good to us. Mm. Now, those are the hardest moments for a preacher. Because he knows he has a word, but he doesn't want to go any further. <laughs> he doesn't want to quench the Spirit of God. He wants the Holy Ghost to have its way in everything that we do. Mm. For those of you watching online, we just really encourage you to be a part of our congregation. Just rejoice with us, worship the Lord with us. If you have a need, please just let us know what it is so we can be praying for it. Uh, it's been a been a busy week uh, a lot of a lot of things going on a lot of different ones in the hospital and so forth but god is faithful amen that was pretty weak god is faithful amen amen amen, amen. amen. there you go hey, i always count on jojo in the back <laughs> amen this morning i want to share with you we've been talking a little bit about the authority of the believer and I know that this particular subject gets all kind of distorted. And uh, I have, as I've said before, I have good friends of mine on both sides of the fence, okay? Generally, what I have found out is most of the time it's a matter of how it's presented, uh, if we present it biblically, usually there's, there's no confusion. But how many of you know uh, that sometimes preachers just get real excited and uh, probably add a few things to it that don't need to be added? Um, and then it gets confusing, okay? Uh, because it's not coming right from the Word of God. So we've talked in the last uh, three or four meetings We've talked about our authority being from God. And we talked about authority being what the Word of God says. That is our authority. That's where we stand. I don't have authority to reach out and claim certain things if it's not backed up by the Word of God. If it is backed up by the Word of God, then I have every right to stand on the authority of the Word of God and speak it out. So I use examples that in Acts when the jailer was going to kill himself um, because uh, Paul and Silas were escaping from the prison. And, you know, they refused to leave. And the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And uh, Paul and him said, believe upon the Lord and you and your household shall be saved. Now that's recorded in the word of God, okay? So because that's recorded in the Word of God, I have authority to stand on that Word. And I can look at my children, and no matter where they're at in their spiritual walk, uh, or maybe not even serving God, I can look at them and I can stand in authority and simply say, Lord, my wife and I love you. We've been serving you the majority of our life. And this is a promise that you gave that our household would be saved as well. And I hold steadfast to that promise in the word of God. And I use the authority of that word and I speak that over my children. And uh, I spoke it so much over my children that my oldest son got to a place that he knew that our prayers were answered. So he would, I remember one time he, he said something to my wife, and my wife said, well, I'm going to pray for a godly woman to come into your life to marry. And he says, Mom, please don't pray. All right, because he, he knew a godly woman would come into his life, all right. And so we spoke things over our children, but it was things from the Word of God that we would speak over our children. And that was the confidence that I had, that it was his word, and his word would always be true. So, as I've shared with you before, nowhere in the scripture does it tell me that uh, I have authority to 
claim certain things, okay? But I do have authority. Whatever the word has declared for me, I hold steadfast to that word. Then we shared with you a little bit about how the enemy is trying to convince us as Christians that we really don't have that true walk with God. Or as I've shared with you after pastoring many, many years for the enemy to come to me and just try to convince me that I really wasn't walking with God or I I really wasn't saved. I just thought I was and so forth like that. And I know a lot of us battle thoughts that the enemy puts in our mind. But we have to understand that from the scriptures, you are a brand new creation in God. Old things pass away. All things become brand new in your life. And that simply means that I am not who I used to be, all right? Before I came to Christ, I was one type of person. But when I came to Christ, I became another person brand new individual created not only in his image and likeness but all that he is I am now that doesn't mean that I'm running around here saying I'm a god that's not what I'm talking about but everything he has promised me I know I can lay hold of everything that he says that I am I am I am an overcomer I am victorious greater is he that is in me than he that is within the world and I can go on and on so every Everything that his word has made a declaration about who I am as a new child of God, I stand in that authority. And when the enemy tries to come and tell me I'm something less than that, I can look at the enemy and say, no, you don't understand, Satan. You're a liar. God is true. And this is who I am. And I stand in that as being a born-again child of God. The enemy comes and says, well, that's your nature. That's just who you are. Don't you know that all Irish people have tempers or are or whatever it might be and and use all kinds of things. Listen, when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, I stopped being who I was. The old nature is not there anymore. If I had a horrible temper, my temper got sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Now, I'm going to say some things you aren't going to like. All right, if my mouth was a potty mouth, when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, he cleaned my mouth up, all right? I don't have to stand in the pulpit and use foul language to hope all the young guys will think I'm a cool preacher. I've got news for you. I'm a cool preacher anyway, all right? So it doesn't make any difference to me. I don't got to use the language. I don't, I don't got to do that kind of thing. You don't have. You were changed by the power of the cross of Calvary. When I went down on the water in baptism and I went down, I'm telling you, a whole brand new person came up, all right? I was renewed in Christ Jesus. So we talked about that. The enemy wants you to think that the iniquity uh, and the sin nature is who you are. That's not who you are. You were born with that, but thanks to Calvary, that's been eliminated, and that's not who you are. All right, so the enemy comes by, and we had a little kind of a mini debate about, well, if a man thinketh, so is he. All right, that's scriptural. All right, but let me clarify what is meant by that. I can't stop the enemy from flying over my head. I can't stop the enemy from throwing thoughts on my mind, but I sure can stop him from nesting up there and entertaining those thoughts. As long as I don't entertain those thoughts, those thoughts will not remain on me. And the only way it becomes sin is if I act upon those thoughts, all right? So you have to get to a place in your life to where you just simply say, no, that's not who I am. No, that's not what I'm going to act upon. I choose to love my neighbor. I choose to love my brother and my sister. I choose not to go there. I choose not to do that. I choose not to think like that. We have a choice to make. Now, this morning, I'm going to share with you about the strategy that the enemy uses to come against us all the time. If you have your scriptures, I want you to look at the Word of God. 
Brandon, if you'll get 2 Timothy 1 and 10 and Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. So as you get those scriptures, I want you to understand, Jesus destroyed death. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus destroyed death. Now let's look at the word. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished what? Death. Death. Do you know that is the greatest fear that man has, is the fear of death? Because most of the time we are uncertain as to what lies on the other side of that threshold. And because we're not sure about what lies on that other side, we have fear as we approach that. But the scripture says, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If you have your Bible or if you're using an iPad or whatever instrument you got, that you're looking at scriptures, understand Immortality has been brought to life through what? Through the gospel. Through the word of God. Apart from the word of God, I am a dead man floating around on this planet. But according to the word of God, I have been renewed and my body has been quickened by the very spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Amen? So I'm not just roaming around in this world aimlessly, fearfully, but I have been made and created for a reason and for a purpose. Look to your neighbor and say, you've got a purpose. Now, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are still looking for your purpose? Many are still trying to find that purpose. Well, I'm here to tell you what that purpose is. That purpose is to love God with all of your heart, your mind, your body, your soul. That purpose is to love your neighbor as yourself. And your purpose is to win souls for Jesus Christ. And to go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. I remember years ago... We would have revival services when I was a young boy growing up. And our revival services was minimum was two weeks. All right, those were the short revivals. The the longer revivals went on, sometimes it could last a month or more. And uh, I don't know, I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. And my pastor put me and another boy, Gerald Taylor, And uh, me and Gerald would swap off. And one night I would walk, and the next night Gerald would walk. But they had a a devil costume. And I would get in this devil costume, all right? That doesn't sound too spiritual, does it? But uh, hear me out, all right? I'd get in this devil costume. I had a fork and, uh, you know, the horns and all that. And my responsibility was to walk up and down in front of the church house. And they were in there doing songs and doing the preaching and everything. And I had a sign that I was carrying, and the sign says, this church is unfair to my business. (laughs) So I'd walk back and forth and back and forth for the whole service, letting everybody that drove drive by know that This church was unfair to me, all right? It was hurting my business, all right? I think we might need to walk up and down the highway sometime and let people know that that the enemy, that there's a place in this town that is unfair to him, that we don't like him, we don't entertain him, and that we have power and victory over him, amen? A few years ago, we were at a 50-year reunion, uh of different ones from that church, and uh, Gerald happened to be there. It was my first time in one of the reunions, and uh, he brought out a picture, and he says, uh, he said, Mike, 
you remember this, and he showed a picture, and, and then he said, he said, I still got that suit, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I didn't ask him if it still fit him, but anyhow. <laughs> but <clears throat> the enemy has got to understand that we know that he's been defeated. Because, see, if he doesn't know that we know he's been defeated, then he's never going to get off your case. Because he's determined and he's bound and determined to somehow drag you down and pull you down. So I want to talk a little bit about the Word of God today. And I want you to look at that last part of it. That hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now go to Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. (laughs) We have been delivered from slavery. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. We know that means Jesus came down to this earth in a fleshly form. He would be tempted in all manners, okay? He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So what, if I ask you, what does that scripture tell you? Real quickly, what is it saying to you? Jeremy, what's it say to you? He's been defeated. The enemy has been destroyed. Who's been destroyed? The devil, but look at the verse. Who has been destroyed? Death. Who has been destroyed? The one who had the power of death has been destroyed. So that means that the enemy, though he had the power of death, he has been destroyed. We've been freed from death. Death has no more hold over you and I. There's no reason for us to be fearful of death anymore because Jesus has set us free. We are no longer a slave to the enemy. We are free from the hold and the bonds of the enemy. Amen? His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. We've used the scripture many times. But now I want us to go to where we're going today. So if you have your scriptures, I want you to turn to a parable in Mark chapter 4, verse number 3 through 8. And I want to shed some light upon this parable. Because this is an incredible, important parable for us to understand. So Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 8, and we'll go through three sections of this. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on the stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was raised up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Now I want you to go down to verse 14. Jesus is getting ready to explain the parable. The sower sowed the word. And what did he sow? The word. He didn't sow opinions. He didn't sow traditions. Are you listening to me? He sowed the word. Next verse. 
And these are they by the wayside, where the word was sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown. Now, I'm going to give you the biblical way that transpires. Because there's a part of this parable that we don't talk about a whole lot. We talk about mostly this section of it. But we're going to go a little bit further today. But part of that is you're sitting here today, and you, by revelation of God, God speaks something into your heart immediately. Oh, my God, I never saw that. I just never seen it in that way. And you take it and you put it in your heart and you walk out the door. And by the time you get to the door, the enemy says, you know, that really isn't true. That's really not the way you were raised. And on and on and on. And the enemy has come. And so now I'm not talking about my words. I'm talking about the word of God by revelation. That God revealed something to you. And by the time you get it out the door, the enemy has come and tried to take it away from you and make it void. The majority of the time, that is done by offense. You take offense at something that was said. You know there's a truth there. You know there's a revelation there, but you get offended over it. And before you walk out the door, you've already thrown it away, and you've not let it have time to get down into your spirit man. Satan cometh immediately. How, how quickly does he come? Right away. How, how often? Right away. right away. Sometimes while you're sitting in, your, in the seat. He'll come and just, no, that's not of God. But something was telling you it was of God. But then tradition gets in the way, and our people's opinion gets in the way, or someone who has abused something gets in the way, and all of a sudden, those thoughts keep coming to mind where you get offended, and that very revelation and truth that God is trying to share with us, we put it to the side, and it becomes almost void in our life. Taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts next. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. How many of you have ever sat in a church house and somebody preached something or during praise and worship like we had this morning, there's a powerful, mighty revelation of God and man, it just... You immediately received it. But look what happens in verse 17. And you have no root in themselves. And so it endureth for a moment or a time afterwards. But when the afflictions and persecutions arise for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, what does the persecution arise? When persecution and heartaches and afflictions arise, what is going on? The Bible said it is for the what? Word's sake. God is sharing something with us. God is revealing something with us. And the enemy doesn't want you to get a hold of it. And because you're not rooted and grounded and that seed doesn't go in the ground, it doesn't take root. That's why you cannot depend on Paul Roberts. You cannot depend on any one preacher to do your work for you. You've got to cultivate your spiritual life. You've got to pray. You've got to read the Word. You've got to be in fellowship with born-again believers who think like you do, who act, hopefully act like you do, all right? And that you have a relationship. So when a revelation comes to you, it goes into your mind your spirit, man, it takes root there, and it grows, and you grow as a spiritual child of God. Because if you do not cultivate your spiritual walk, something's going to happen. Verse 18, and these are they which are sown among the thorns, which as you hear the word, next, and the cares of this world... 
and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. I believe that's probably where the majority of people have their problems. The things of the world. Getting caught up with the things of the world. Not, not saying, God, I reject you and I reject what you have to say. But you believe it. It lands there. But you just get caught up in everyday life, all right? And the reason we get caught up in everyday life is because we're trying to live it on our own apart from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you cannot get through this life on your own, all right? You've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit leading you and directing you. Verse number 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. Now, this whole parable is talking about what? The what? Talking about the word, all right? Again, it's not talking about my opinions, not talking about my traditions, but we're talking about the Word of God. The Bible says that heaven and earth would pass away, but my Word will what? Will never pass away. As a matter of fact, not only will it not pass away, but it will never return back to you and me void. So whatever the Word has been released to do, that word will do what it's been released to do, and it will not return void. That's the reason I pray over my children. That's the reason I pray over the church. That's the reason I pray over you, because I know that my prayers and the Word of God, when I speak the Word of God, will not return void, but will do exactly what I am asking the Word of God to do. So when I pray for you, I pray the Word of God over you. I just simply pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, you said that trip would prosper and be blessed in every area of his life. So, Lord, I speak blessings and prosperity in every area of his life, beginning with his spiritual life, then with his family life, and then with his job, and in every other area. But what am I doing? I am releasing the Word of God in his his life. It would be one thing for me just to say, Lord, just give, uh, just bless trip this week and give him a good week. All right, that's, that's what I want. But I want to declare what the Word of God has said. Because God said, my Word will not return unto me void. So I speak God's Word. One of the things that we, when we pray, we have to learn how to pray the Word of God. If we pray God's Word, then we can stand on the authority of God's Word. Many have looked at this parable, and what we've done is we've referred to it as the seeds of salvation that have sown, and the different results of evangelism. And that's true, because when we preach the Word, it falls on one of those areas in an individual's life. And ultimately, we pray that it will fall on good grounds and they'll come to the Lord. But however, Jesus is talking not just about the evangelism, but he's talking about the Word of God. The Word of God. So, Jesus taught that when we receive a new understanding of the Word, the enemy is going to try to take it and steal it from us because he doesn't want to apply it in our life. So if I share to you today about you have authority through the Word of God, you have authority to bind and to loosen things on this earth as it is bound and loose in heaven, the enemy doesn't want you to know that. So that word is going to fall somewhere in this category. 
You're either going to receive it. Well, no, I've seen authority abused, and, and I don't believe in authority like that, so I'm not going to receive that. Or you you get it. You say, yeah, it sounds really good to me, but you know, I've got so many things going on in my life. I've got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. Listen, I understand, all right? I know that you have a lot of things to do, but I'm going to be so bold this morning as to share with you, there are a lot of things you think you have to do that you don't have to do. Now, that went over like a lead balloon. And I'm trying to be really careful here. I'm trying to preach and not meddle. <laughs> Listen, <clears throat> I had, we raised three boys. And all three of our boys, they were only a couple of years apart. They were our little stair steps, okay? And all three of them had to be in a different part of Dallas at the same time. All right, one had music lessons. The other had softball or baseball. The other one... Uh, had a band that he was in or, or some other activity. And I'm telling you, there come a time where it just seemed like all we were doing was chauffeuring. That's all we did was chauffeur, getting our kids from one place to the next. And finally, Nancy and I just said, you know what? Enough. <laughs> enough is enough. I love you. I want you all involved in all of that. But I want you in church, too. I want you in church. And my oldest son, he said, Dad, will you, give me, uh, will you buy me a bass guitar? And I said, yeah, I'll buy you a bass guitar. He said, well, I want to be in this band. And I said, I'll tell you what, for every one hour you practice that bass guitar to be in your band, you're going to be on the platform for one hour playing for Jesus. Yeah. And he was. And he's an incredible bass player. But at some point, you know, he wanted to listen to all of his heavy metal headbanging music at that time. Dennis knows all about that. <laughs> all right. That's what he loved. <clears throat> he had all the albums. And I'd just go, and Mom, Nancy, and I, we'd go in his room at night, and uh, I didn't throw any of his albums away. Man, I sure anointed them. That had more olive oil on his records than you can shake a stick at it. Hey, you couldn't even really hold them in his hand, all right? They just slide right out. And I loved it when the needle would hit and go all the way across. Yay, Lord, one for the master. And he'd get so irritated. But I know we get busy and and today, you know, our kids seem to, they've got to be involved in so many different things in the school and all of that. But what I'm trying to share with you is that you have the authority to say enough is enough. And you have authority to say no. Because your welfare of your children is extremely important. And one day our children will stand before God. And we have to make sure we've done as much on the spiritual aspect as we have on the other parts of their life. I'm not asking you, and please don't go out of here and, and go home and tell your kids, all right, pastor said you can't do nothing no more. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, okay? What I am saying is somewhere along the line, we've got to learn how to balance everything for our children, for our own life, for our relationship with our husband or our wife or companion. We've got to learn how to find that balance and let God's Word speak for us and not everybody else. Well, everybody else is doing it. Every, you know, uh, Tom's mom lets them do everything. Then you go talk to Tom's mom and Tom's mom says, oh, no, I don't, <laughs> all right? They told me that you let yours do everything, and, and it becomes a back and forth. Now, what I'm saying is that when God reveals things to us through the Word of God, then we have to be responsible on how we receive that and how we act upon it. There's another scripture that tells us that, fathers, you're not supposed to provoke your children to wrath. And that means sometimes when you want to grab Johnny and, and really tell him how it used to be in the olden days, uh, you don't do it, all right? You don't provoke him to wrath. 
But you don't sit down and talk to him like he's an adult if he's nine years old because he's not an adult yet at nine years old. You talk to him like a nine-year-old and like a mom and a dad, and you say, listen, I love you, I care for you, I'm willing to die for you, but there are rules, and the rule is God's Word. I'm not talking about legalistic, okay? I'm talking about just simply saying this is God's Word. But many times when we receive these things and God tells us, yep, that's absolutely right, that's what you need to do, we go like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. And you've allowed the enemy to steal the Word of God from your heart. Don't let the enemy steal the Word of God from your heart. When God gives a revelation, many times we, have a, we can have an incredible service. And man, there is a powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. God is doing great and wonderful things. And we walk out those doors and man, it seems like a freight train hits us. Anything that can go wrong seems to go wrong. This week has been a week, something similar to that. It just seems like every time I turned around, somebody else was being in, put in the hospital. And you can make your rounds and go from uh, Presbyterian to Tyler to Athens. And, I mean, it just unbelievable what took place. And then other phone calls that we would get. And it's been a tough week. And the reason it's been a tough week is because God's Word says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And greater is He that is within us than he that is in the world. And it's like the enemy hears that and he goes outside and he says, Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to see if they really believe that. None of you have had those kind of weeks in your life, all right? I'll pray for you after service. <clears throat> We've all had those weeks. When, I mean, everything was going fantastic, everything was going great, and we felt like we were on top of the world, and we could conquer the world, and all of a sudden, boom, everything, all the cares of the world, and all the stuff going on in the world, and, and, and it just bombarded us, and we go like, Lord, where did that come from? Listen, you shouldn't even have to ask God where it come from. You know where it come from. It didn't come from God. It came from the enemy who is trying to steal your joy and rob you of your faith. So we go back and tell the enemy, no, I will not receive that. I am believing victory on top of victory on top of victory this week. And I know that we're going to come through it. Your word has already declared that for me. So I know that we will be victorious. Three things occur. The word is sown. Satan may steal the word immediately because we become offended. The worries of life and deceitfulness of wealth and sin and chokes out the word. And I'm going to come back to wealth here in just a moment. And the word can be encouraged to take root and spring up. But tribulation and persecutions comes our way. Now, the wealth of this world, when it rises up, all right? I was taught the only persons that were going to get to heaven were going to be the ones that were really poor. All right? So there was a long period of my life where I felt like, all right, I'm a shoe in, all right, <laughs> because I sure don't have a whole lot. <laughs> the cares of wealth and riches. And what that was simply means, it doesn't say that it is impossible. If you go to Jerusalem where the gates are, there is a small gate, and that gate was where the camels would go in and out of. And it was a very small gate. And it was very difficult for some of the camels to get through that gateway. And that was the analogy that was being used. All right? It would be very gift. If the cares of our life and the cares of the things of this life, and that's what wealth is, it's just the things of this life. All right? If they overshadow and they become almost like a burden unto us, 
That distracts us from the Word of God. All right? Can I give you an example of what happened in the year 2008? Most of you know we went through a financial crisis in our country. I'm telling you right now, that's nothing compared to what's coming. All right? And you need to be really careful and cautious of how you invest your money and what you buy on big ticket items because a lot of things are in the process of changing, all right? Uh, I'm not going to go into the dollar or anything like that, but I'm just telling you, be cautious and be careful. And be careful of any preacher who tries to tell you what you have to do, all right? Because if you remember Y2K, I mean, you remember that? All right, we had so much fear-mongering going around. People were hoarding up stuff. There ain't nothing wrong with preparing, but they were hoarding up so much stuff, and uh, that kind of came to be pretty much not. All right, God will not use a spirit of fear to control you. He uses the power of love to move you. And so be, be very careful. But when all of those happen, I watch people who were in the faith for years. I mean, they were in the faith for years. They weren't just someone who had come to church and gave their heart to the Lord. They'd been Christians for a long time. And when they lost their job, when they lost their cars, when they lost their homes, and everything that they had, their savings was gone, everything was being taken from them, I watched those cares of all of the wealth that they had become so heavy on them, they walked away and was beginning to blame God. And But God, why did you? Why did you? Why did you? How come you did this? And why did you let that happen? God didn't do that. The enemy did it. The enemy in John, Scripture says, he comes to do what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Dana, he wants everything you've got. Everything. And he's not satisfied until he gets your joy. Because if he gets your joy and your joy is gone, you don't care about anything else and you'll just surrender it all over just to stop him. So the joy is, is powerful for us to maintain our joy in our heart and in our life. So we go on a little bit further. Satan comes. But now I want us to look at verse number 35 through verse 41. The storms which come up. Remember, Jesus had just ministered tremendously. And people were believing him and following him. And listen to what he said. And now he's, he's going to cross over to the other side. Mark 4, 35 through 41. He's going to cross over. And now we're going we're to find out what happened. All right? So he's been sitting at the feet of Jesus, the disciples were, and while they were sitting there, the scripture begins to share some things that happened. Can we get that? Being slow? All right. I'll turn in your Bible. That's a better place anyway. 435, and it'll come up in a minute. Okay. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awakened him and saith unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and he rebuked the wind and said unto the seas, <coughs> Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
Next verse. Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. <laughs> now, oh, you went back to three. It did automatically? Well, it was supposed to go to number one. But that, that's, a good, that's a good way to finish that part anyway. All right, because that's what happened. All right, now look at this. Here's what happened. They preach, Jesus preaches the word. And not only does he preach the word, but he takes time to explain the word. And he says, this is what's going to happen. The seed's going to go out. Some of it's going to be rejected immediately. Some of it is going to come and it's going to fall on stony grounds. And as soon as the sun comes out, persecution, tribulation, it's going to be gone. Others are going to fall on good ground. And it's going to produce fruit. No sooner does he get through saying it that they get on a boat to go to the other side and persecution through the storm comes up. God, where are you? God, why aren't you with us? God, why are you letting all of this happen to us right now? God, why this? God, he, they ultimately proved the very thing Jesus was talking about. And Jesus said, basically, O oh, ye of little faith. Now, some of you this morning are going to walk out of this building, and you're going to go like, well, that was okay, but that wasn't the best I ever heard Pastor Paul preach, so we're going to put that in a I don't know file. Others of you are going to go out of here and say, wow, praise God, hallelujah. And you'll get a phone call one day this week or somebody's going to come knocking on your door and man, your joy's going to be stolen. Or some of you will walk out of here and you're going to go, yahoo, that's a good one. I'm going to be victorious all week long and you're going to win souls for the Lord. The key to this is understanding the word. If you understand and, and you hear the word of healing and deliverance and you believe it and you receive it and you accept it, the odds are you're going to see more of it in your life. If you don't believe it, you don't accept it, the odds are you're not going to believe it. And I remember a, a, an incredible man of God, Jack Deere, several years ago, he I was a professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, and he made a statement in one of his books, and he simply said, you know what? I found out over the years that I was taught not to believe in the supernatural of God. He said, if I simply opened up the Word of God, I would see that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He does not change. I would have come out believing in what the Word says, but I chose to believe what man said and what man said taught me. That's why I've told you a hundred times over, and I'll tell you a hundred times again. Don't take my word. Look at the word of God. That is your source, and that is your strength, is God's word. People have powerful personalities, and they can cause people to believe a lot of stuff. All right? Be careful. Go to the word of God. We have a choice in our life to accept it and receive it. The guys in the back of the boat, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? God, don't you care that my children are going astray? God, don't you care that sickness has come against my life? God, don't you care that I can't pay my bills? God, don't you care? God, don't you care? And the scripture says plainly that the Lord cast your cares upon him for he careth for you. <coughs> He cares for you. He does care. And he's already declared it in his word. So if he does care and he's declared it in his word, don't let the enemy steal the word of God from you. Hold steadfast to his word. I remember years ago I thought I was going to die. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And they, I had, uh, I don't know, I had an infected liver and kidney problems and strep throat. And I don't know, about 10 things all at the same time. 
And I told Nancy, I said, Nancy, when I die, I want yellow roses at my funeral. I was living in Wisconsin, so it wasn't a Texas thing, all right? And uh, I said, I want yellow roses, all right? Called the pastor. I really thought I was going to die. I mean, I really did. I had never been so sick in my life. And I just said, Lord, I guess this is it. And I couldn't have been more than about, I don't know what it was, about 25 or 28. Yeah, about 25. And, I mean, I was really bad shape. And I remember taking those scriptures. And first of all, I'd lay there in bed and I'd just put them on my chest. Lord, I cover myself with the word of God. I just cover myself with everything in this word you said is yes and amen. And it's yes and amen in my life. And I stand on you and believe you. I didn't get much better. (laughs) I'm honest, all right? So my next was, Father... (laughs) I'm serious. Nancy, you were there, weren't you? She knows. I just, Father, let every word in here saturate and penetrate into my mind. Lord, from my mind, let it go into my spirit. And Lord, from my spirit, let it be made manifest in my physical body. And you know what? I got better. Now, I don't know. It didn't have anything probably to do with putting the Bible on my head. I think it had everything to do with I got to that point to where I said, Lord, whatever it takes, I want your word in me. Abide in me and my word in you. Ask what you will, and it shall be done and given unto you. Let my words abide in you, live in you, a part of you. I don't have to stop and think I can't do this to this guy. I just don't want to do it. The word in me won't let me do it. The word said, that's not who you are. You used to be like that. So now... If somebody tries to run me off the road, I wave at them. (laughs) You do what? I wave at them very nicely. (laughs) I don't have to think about it. Why? Because that's not who I am anymore. That's not who I am. I've been changed by the power. Does that mean that I don't have issues in my life? Does that mean the enemy doesn't constantly come at me? No, he comes at me all the time. All right? And if you think the pastor doesn't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff, oh, boy, you're mistaken. I worry about it. things come at me constantly. Every time I walk out of this door, first thing I do, we get in the car. Nancy, usually what's the first thing I ask you? Did I do all right? right? (laughs) You would think after 54 years or 53 years, I'd know if I did all right or not. But that's first words every week. Did I do okay, hon? Why? Because I, I care. And I'm concerned. Because I don't want to lead anybody astray. I don't want anybody to have false hope. And I don't want anyone trusting in what I say. I want it to be in what God's word says. That's your safety. That's just how I am. So we're getting ready to have a baptism here in just a minute. We speak by faith. The positive actions of faith is necessary if we're going to keep the seed and the word of God in our hearts and expect a great harvest. I'm believing God for a great harvest. I look in just the last few months what God has been doing in our local body. And we've been, we were hit hard um, with Rick in the hospital right now. We've lost four men. Uh, by death uh, in the last couple of years. And our church isn't all that large. And uh, four men, that's a lot of men. Uh, And it it hit us. It's hit us. But God, in his way, is replenishing and bringing more. He's building us. He knows where we need to be to do what he's called us to do. And he's doing that. So you guys, some of you, you're not here by accident. You're here by design. God 
knew we needed you. And some of you, all of you, all of you, you're very important to God and to the kingdom of God. I want you to spend time in his word. I want you to really spend time in his word this week. And if you would, go, go over Mark chapter 4. Just, just read it. Let it soak in. Because the enemy will try to steal everything that you received this morning. By the time you get out the door, he can do it. And you can resist him. And you can say, no, I refuse to let you beat me down. I won't do it. And you can be strong enough. <coughs> you can be strong enough. And you can make it. We're going to have our children come in if they would. All right. Yeah, y'all can just sit there somewhere. All right. Amen. We're going to have a baptism this week, and we're going to have another one next week. So isn't that awesome? That's awesome what God does. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Amen. Okay. All right, so Mark, you want to bring Sebastian up? Ben, you want to put that in the water for me? Mom, Dad, do you want to come up? Please. Oh, the Word of God. The Word of God says, repent and be baptized. Amen. Sebastian, you ready? Mark, you, you work in the children's church, and uh, so please. Awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're going to have another baptism next week, so uh, come and just love God. <laughs> if 
if you've not been baptized, I encourage you to. The scripture talks about repent and be baptized. And the best way I know how to explain baptism is very simple. You just look at the book of Romans. The book of Romans simply tells us that that is identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are baptized our, into his death, and we are raised up into the newness of life in Christ Jesus. And I believe there's so much power in that that I don't know that we've ever tapped into it. But if you've had an abusive life, I believe that that abuse can be washed away. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that family, uh, some people would use the word curse, are things that have bothered your family. I believe that when you come to Christ, it's broken. And when you're baptized, it's just left there. And you walk up totally, completely cleansed and free. I've seen so many things broken at baptism. Hurts, pains, so much. You're just totally broken. God has the victory. And uh, so, if you haven't been, we were doing a baptism in um, California. We had 11 that had come to be baptized. And I think by the time it was over, we baptized 42, 43 or something. But people just realized that, you know, I just didn't realize the impact that it had upon me. Now, it will be a charge to you and Children's Church to really help Sebastian understand everything that happened for him when he got baptized. So that responsibility goes on to you leaders to help them learn. But I really, really encourage you. If you haven't been, please do. Jack Hayford had a little booklet out many years ago. I don't have it anymore. I don't know where it's at. But I remember reading it, and he said that in all of the counseling he did, because he passed away a few months back at about, I think he was 90 or 91, uh, when he wrote the little booklet, he said over all the years, the majority of the counseling that he did was those who had never been baptized. And it really kind of made you wonder about it. But basically what he was saying is that was your first act of obedience. Repent and be baptized. And if you did not follow through with that first act of obedience, a lot of times you're going to be out of obedience to the Lord throughout your Christian walk. And it would open up doors uh, that don't need to be opened. So he was just basically saying, if you repent and you do that, you do that first work of obedience right away, you're set in a pattern in your life to be obedient to the Word of God. And I, you know, after I read it, I go like, well, that's pretty powerful <laughs> teaching. And uh, so I encourage you to do it. We take baptisms for granted here in the United States. We don't think much about it. Charismatic churches where have not done the best um, in following through with baptism. I believe it's very extremely important because it's telling the whole world I have made a choice and I choose Jesus. Amen. So God love you. God bless you is our prayer. Be praying this afternoon especially uh, around 3 o'clock uh, we're going to meet with uh, Wendy and uh, Rick's family as they make a, their major decision concerning Rick. Uh, but like I told Wendy, I'm believing God for a miracle up to the very last breath. I, I'll never stop believing for miracles. Uh, I've just seen too many in my life. So be with us as we're with the family. Pray for us, please, uh, that everything will go the way God wants it to go. That's the only way I know how to say it. Just the way God wants it to go. Amen. God love you guys. I, I love you guys so much. I just, I love y'all so much. You're special. That's all Sam. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, 
need to know him. That's all I can say. You just need to know him. And I would love to tell you that if you say, Jesus, come into my life, it would be a bed of roses from here on out. But I wouldn't be speaking honestly. Because I know there will always be trials and persecutions that come our way. But I know one thing. With God, all things are possible. And we can persevere and we'll overcome. If you don't know him, right now is a good time to say, Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And I'll serve you all the days of my life. Is there anyone? All right. Well, Father, then I ask that you would bless this congregation. Lord, those that couldn't be with us this morning, especially Trish and Brooke and her leg, Lord, Wendy and Rick's family, Lord, I just speak peace in their life today. And I ask God that you would touch and heal them. Lord, I, I believe you to the very end. I will trust you and have faith in you. I will believe your word. I'll stand on your word. Greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God love you. Shake hands with someone. Tell them you love them. And may God give you the best week you've ever had. He can't give you anything but the best because he's God. Amen. You want to lead us? We decree? Camp. Coffin. Lake area. The world shall be saved. I sing praises to you.